All right, well, this morning uh, we're moving into Romans 13. Not going to take the whole chapter this time. Uh, there's plenty in the, the seven verses we're going to be looking at, plus the, the text itself really divides into at least two sections. <clears throat> but let me begin by reading the text we're looking at this morning. So Paul writes in Romans 13, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning in verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Well, sounds quite quite plain, quite clear, but there's, there's a lot here. Uh, so may the Lord bless this part of His Word to our growth and understanding, our growth in grace this morning. Now, last time Paul told us how we are to respond to all the love and mercy that He has given to us, that He has shown us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to offer ourselves to Him as living and holy sacrifices. Now, I don't know if, if we recognize this, but Paul's already told us this and in a different way back in chapter 6. He said that when we trusted Jesus and we died with Him and we were raised with Him again to life, it was that we might live a new kind of life. He said in verses 12 and 13, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. You know, what, what Paul said there is exactly what he's telling us now when he says, offer yourselves as living and holy sacrifices to God, just simply from a different angle. But the question really is, what does that kind of life look like? Well, that's what Paul went on to tell us. And last week, he gave us three things. He says that we offer ourselves to him as sacrifices, which means we worship him. When? First, we discover the gift God has given to us. And we each have at least one, and we use it to serve each other that we all might grow more into the image of Christ. Okay? So that's one thing. Use what God has given us to serve one another. Secondly, when we love each other as family, encouraging, honoring, remember trying to outdo one another and showing honor or drawing attention to each other's gifts and abilities rather than our own, and caring for each other as members of the same family. That's the kind of relationship the Lord wants us to have because He has knit us together as a family in the body of Christ. And we're one local expression of that in this church and our relationship to one another really needs to extend beyond uh, what, what we do here on the Lord's Day. And then thirdly, when we love our enemies. Again, that's one of the most difficult things God has given us to do, but He says when your enemy dishes out evil, Return good. 
leaving any vengeance, any retribution in the Lord's hands. Now, this morning we're going to see one of the ways in which God dishes this out to those that wrong us. It's through the government. Okay, so this morning Paul continues, and he really does through the rest of the letter, to show us what it means to offer ourselves to God as living sacrifices. This morning he's focusing on how we should interact with the state. He begins the section as he did the last with, with the, the general command, you know, the larger rubric in verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now, let's try to understand what Paul's saying here. It's, it's really not difficult, but there are some things that I think are interesting. By governing authorities, he obviously means those in the state who are in power those who rule, and I'm going to be using the, the, the terms authority and ruler and magistrate and, you know, powers and things like that. It, it all refers to the same thing. That authority God has established in the sphere of society or the state. Now, I want you to notice that Paul doesn't say if that governing authority takes a certain form, you are to submit to it. You know, some believe that, certainly kings did in the past, that, that that was divinely instituted by God. But you see, it doesn't matter what form of government it is, if it is an authority that he has established, whether it is a king or a parliament, which is what ruled England after they executed the king, or whether it's the king and parliament, which is kind of what we have today, and at least in England, or a democracy, which we have with a president a Senate, a House of Representatives, and a Supreme Court, or even a Caesar, okay? Whatever the rule the Lord has established, Paul says we need to submit to it. He says every person is. That means whether you're an unbeliever or a believer, we all alike must do this. And the reason is because, he says, God is the one who has ordained it. Now, I've already mentioned that, that this is simply an extension of his rule, Christ's rule, really, over the world. And in his rule of the world, he has placed authority in every sphere of life. And we usually think of what's called sphere sovereignty, that there are three spheres. And one could argue maybe there's four, but I'm just going to go with three. And that would be government and church and family. He's placed authority in each one of these so there would not be chaos or anarchy, but there would be order. In the church, we know that he's appointed elders as, as rulers, okay, authorities, that don't rule in their own authority, but rather rule in Christ's authority and they minister his, his rule through the Word. That's the reason why Paul, wherever he went, was always teaching and preaching the Word of God because he was trying to help those listening to him understand what the king of the church really desired. He says in Acts 20, verses 18 through 20 to the Ephesian elders, you yourselves know from the first day I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. And we do know from the examples we have of his teaching in, in in the book of Acts and certainly in the epistles that all of his teaching came from God's Word. And rather than appealing to his own authority, he would appeal to the Old Testament to draw these truths out. So he was ministering Christ's authority and Christ's rule by declaring his, his Word. And for our part, since it is our Lord's authority, we do need to submit to it. Hebrews 13, verse 17, the author to the Hebrews writes, Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So again, the idea is when we submit to the rule that he's established in the church, we're submitting to Christ. Now in the family, he's given also authority. He's, he's established rule. He's given the husband to be the head of his wife. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is, is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. He's also given parents to be the head of their children. 
He writes in Ephesians 6.1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And of course, the same is true of the state. Daniel writes in Daniel 2, verse 21, It is he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. Well, that's what Paul's telling us in our text, isn't it? God is the one who establishes authority. It's an extension of his rule. And that's the reason why we need to submit to it. So any authority that he appoints in each sphere is meant to bring order. And it's meant to bring a blessing to those who are under that authority. That's very important, okay? This authority is ordained to be a blessing to those under that authority. It is given, notice, to serve. Not to lord it over, okay? Not to tyrannize, not to enslave, not to make those who are under any authority I have do my will but it's given to us in order to serve those who are under our authority. Again, remember the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how he used his authority on earth. He was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet he was the one who stooped to serve his disciples. He used his authority to minister to them and to protect them and provide for them. And now that he is glorified and exalted and in heaven, he still uses that same authority to serve us, even though he's king and we submit to him, he is serving us. Now, we, we understand that the opposite of this, of this established rule of this authority, is anarchy. Anarchy means the absence of a ruler, the absence of a king. Without it, there's another law that prevails. It's the, called the law of the jungle, right? Might makes right. If I'm stronger than you, I'll take what you have. It's going to be mine. That's what would happen if we didn't have government. So we have to recognize that even governments run by evil men can be better than no government at all, even though we seem to have a lot to complain about. There's a lot we should be thankful for. Okay, so God establishes authority. It's an extension of his rule. So we need to submit to it. Secondly, because... God is the source of this authority. We need to see that if we resist it, we're really resisting him, aren't we? Not the, not the magistrate so much as him. And Paul tells us if we resist, there will be consequences. Okay, he says in verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Now, that sounds rather harsh. It almost sounds like Paul's saying you're going to be lost if you do this, but I think what he's saying is the word can be translated punishment. Okay? Those who oppose government will receive punishment. And we're going to look at the government's power to punish in just a moment. But we need to know why it is we'll be punished. We'll be punished not only because we're resisting God's authority, His established authority, but also because in so doing, and this may sound strange, we're violating his law. Now notice what Paul writes in verses 3 and 4. And this may surprise us, and it surprises me. We have to kind of make sense of this. He says this, and again, remember, this is Caesar he's referring to. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good... And you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. Now, this seems a bit perplexing, but uh, let's try to un unravel this. First of all, Paul is saying here that God has ordained government to enforce what is good. And what is good? Well, the only thing that really is good is, is God, but an expression of that goodness is in His law. Okay? His rule of right and wrong, his definition of love. That is what they are to enforce. Now, the, the thing that's kind of perplexing here is that many of the rulers in the history of the world, and perhaps the ones that are even ruling over us right now, have never even read God's law. Perhaps they're not even aware of what it, what it says. Well, that's true. 
But we also need to understand that it's true that they have an innate understanding of what those requirements or those commandments actually require because God has revealed them to everyone by His Holy Spirit. You know, there's that belief that conscience is informed by God's law. And when it convicts us for doing something wrong, it's convicting us based on that standard. Well, where does that standard, that innate sense of God's law actually come from? Well, some believe it's a remnant of um, what man used to have before the fall. And when he fell, we still have that remnant, that, that shadowy understanding, that innate sense of right and wrong. But I think it's the work of the Holy Spirit convicting the world of sin. I mean, how are you going to convict of sin unless you reveal the standard? That's what he does. He, he reveals what God desires in our conscience. Both, I think, what God commands us to do towards him, I think we can deduce from natural revelation, general revelation, everything that God requires in the first four commandments. And certainly we can deduce everything that he requires from us towards mankind in general. This is what we call natural law. You ever heard that term, natural law? Uh, Rutherford and others believe that that is what governors should govern by, natural law. But what is natural law? Natural law is that innate, inborn understanding. I guess I shouldn't use innate if I'm going to say it's from the Holy Spirit. But let's say it's that work of the Holy Spirit revealing to us what it is that God really desires. That's what they should rule by. Let's remember what Paul said in chapter 2 of Romans in verses 14 and 15. For when Gentiles, those who don't have God's revelation, who do not have the law, do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. You see, that's a clear expression of the fact that everybody understands what God's law requires. They know the difference between right and wrong, and that's what the government is supposed to enforce. Now, if God commands them to enforce that law, and we resist them, we're not only disobeying the authority that God has appointed and so disobeying Him, but we're also breaking his law. And so we are again disobeying him. And Paul is telling us if it's a punishable crime, the state will punish us. Now, the question we need to ask is, is that, is that good or bad? <laughs> well, it's good. Paul tells us that the state is God's minister to us for good. You know, when there are consequences for doing things that are wrong, it helps us to do what's right, doesn't it? You know, it, it, those pressures make us go in the right direction, but it also helps restrain other people from doing what's wrong, which is a further blessing for us because this is one of the ways in which God preserves society so that He can preserve His people, so that His work can continue. The government is God's minister to us for good. Now, I don't think Paul here is saying that this authority is never abused, that it never punishes those who do good or approves of those who do evil. I mean, just look at our society, right? He's telling us what God intends, why he gave government, what it is they're responsible to do, and what it is he's going to hold our leaders accountable to do. And they have to give answer on the day of judgment. But even when they fail, they're still doing something of this, okay? I mean, think about things that are prohibited in our culture. And we see that some of those things, many of those things, still do line up with, with God's law. And we need to be thankful for that. So again, consider the alternative. Consider anarchy. What we have is still better than no government at all. God has ordained it for our good. Now, thirdly, all rulers need a way to enforce their authority, okay, a means to exact justice when we do wrong, to, to bring this punishment. For this, Paul says, God has given them the power of the sword, and this refers to the right 
to punish justly, okay, even to the point of execution for capital crimes. And again, that's another area where our culture falls short. You know, the, the things that people do that require capital punishment, but are, I mean, some of these things are government doesn't think are crimes at all. But also it includes the right to raise and maintain an army to use against those who would injure us unjustly. And we're not going to have time to develop that, but I just wanted to mention that. The power of the sword is not only to protect us from each other, okay, but it's also to protect us from foreign invaders. Now, this sword that the government wields is what is supposed to make us afraid, okay, to motivate us to turn from evil and to do what's right, to restrain our sin and that of those around us to keep us safe. It's supposed to do that for all people. Now, we have more than that. We have the Holy Spirit to restrain us. We have the day of judgment in front of us and the knowledge that we're going to be judged on that day. That restrains us. But, you know, a lot of people aren't thinking about those things. This is meant to restrain them and us as well. Now, Paul said earlier, remember, that we are not to seek revenge. Okay, when somebody does something against us, return good for evil. But to leave room for God's wrath, well, this is one of the ways in which he administers that wrath or he executes it. Government, Paul tells us in verse 4, is his avenger. So instead of seeking revenge for the things that people have done against us, we need to bring those offenses to the government, to the authorities, to let them handle it. I mean, that's implied here, isn't it? How can the state punish with the sword unless they know a crime's been committed? Okay, so we need to let them know that the crime has been committed. The government is for our protection, and it is to seek that retribution that we are not to seek. So that idea of don't get mad, get even, no, don't get mad, return good for evil, and if there's a crime committed, report it to the government, except, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, unless the one who injures us is a believer. If that's the case, we shouldn't bring those charges to the state. We should bring them instead to the elders of the church because we don't want to display to the world a litigious Christ, if I can put it in that way. We don't want to misrepresent the Lord Jesus. If we call ourselves Christians, okay, the world is going to judge Christ by the way we live. And if they see us bringing lawsuits against our brothers in Christ, and at the same time we say we love them, well, there's going to be a problem with that, isn't there? So if it's in-house, we need to keep it in-house. But if it is an unbeliever who has injured us, we need to take it to the authorities and let them administrate, administer justice. Okay. Let the court exact punishment if they are guilty. Now, finally, we need to support our rulers. And, and that is a hard thing. But we need to understand that's, that's how it works. Paul says in verse 6, for because of this, because of everything we've seen, you know, that it's God's minister for our good and they're meant to exact justice and so forth, because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God. Notice again the emphasis ordained by God. He's appointed them. They are his servants, devoting themselves to this very thing. One thing that <clears throat> we all have to come to grips with is the fact that the state is not a business right? It's, it's, a, it's a minister. It's a servant, okay? It doesn't generate income. You know, they're not producing anything. They're not selling anything. But what they're doing is they're ensuring that we can produce and that we can sell and that we can make a profit and that we can keep our profits, you know, at least some of them. And because we benefit from that work, okay, we are to pay a portion of those profits to them so that they can ensure our safety to continue this work. Now, if you've been reading 1 Samuel, which is the book we're reading this, this month for our reading the Bible together, you probably remember that when Israel asked for a king, Samuel told them first, count the cost. Because if you have a king, this king would take your sons and make them his soldiers your daughters 
for perfumers and for cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves for his servants, a tenth of your seed and vineyards for his officers and servants, your male and your female servants and your best young men and donkeys for his work. He'll take a tenth of your flocks and you will become his servants. So Samuel said, you want a king? This is what it's going to cost you, okay? It's going to take resources to support a government. Well, that's exactly why we must pay. And when we pay, let's not forget, we need to remember we're really supporting God's servants, God's institution, not man's. It's like when we give in church, you know, we're not giving to, to man, we're giving to God. And when we give to pay taxes, we're really not giving to the state, we're giving to God because He's the one who's told us to, to pay those taxes, right? So we're supporting God's institution, and we need to look at it in that way. Paul concludes in this way in verse 7, Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Tax is tribute. That's the tax that's levied on persons and their properties, their estates. Custom is the tax that is levied on goods and merchandise, imports and exports. Covers quite a bit of ground. Fear is the reverential obedience that we owe rulers because of their power to punish. Okay, they bear the sword. We need to fear that. And honor is what we are to give those who are in office. Okay. Now, in closing, let me answer, I think, about four questions that may arise from this. And the first question is this. Are we to honor those who hold office, you know, give honor to those whom honor is due, even if they happen to be wicked individuals? Yeah? I mean, we ever experienced that? Well, the answer is yes, because let's not forget who it is that Paul is saying we should honor. Caesar, okay? Caesar, even Caesar was to be honored. Now, it may be that our rulers are not personally honorable men or women, okay? They may be unworthy, in which case Paul says pray for them, okay? We need to pray for them. But we still need to honor and submit to the office they hold, okay? So we need to honor their office and we need to show them that honor. So try to distinguish the man from the office, okay? We are honoring him because he holds the office, and not a wicked man who holds the office, so to speak. Secondly, should we obey our government in everything? Is Paul saying just, this is a blanket statement, submit to whatever the government wants you to do, tells us to do? Well, no. It's clear from Scripture that when the magistrate tells us not to do something that God commands us to do, or, not, or to do something, he forbids. Okay, and we, that's going on right now. We have to disobey the government. But remember, we also need to be willing to face the consequences. How we're going to find the courage to do that, we're going to look at this evening. When the Sanhedrin asked the apostles, why didn't you listen to us? We told you no longer to teach and preach in the name of Jesus, and yet you filled Jerusalem with his teaching. They replied, we must obey God rather than man. Now, that is true in every sphere of authority that God has ordained, whether the state, the church, or the family. We must always obey God rather than men. Now, third, and here's an interesting question, is there ever a time when we can rebel, fight against the government when it becomes too corrupt? That, that's a very you know, controversial question. What about the English Civil War when... Parliament, you know, led by Cromwell, the parliamentary forces fought against King Charles I and, remember, overcame him and executed him. Was, it, was that right? What about the Revolutionary War? You know, how did this country actually come to be when the American colonies declared independence from England? You know, were they right in doing this? Well, there are those who say no. Okay, we always need to submit. But there are others who believe that if the authority becomes tyrannical, they may be overthrown. 
but only by lawful authority. Okay, that, that's an important key thing. Now, let's again look at these two examples. <clears throat> Who was it that fought against Charles I? It was Parliament, okay? lawfully ordained authority. Why did they fight against him? It was because he was exercising, the charge against him was exercising an unlimited and tyrannical power that overthrew the rights of the people. Okay, Samuel Rutherford's thesis in the book Lex Rex, or The Law is King, is that even kings are subject to God's law and may be overthrown if they violate their God-given mandate. Okay, well, what about the American Revolution? What happened in that case? <laughs> well, the provincial representatives met together, the American colonies. They looked at what the king and parliament of England was doing, uh, which in this case was um, um, exercising the same tyrannical power over the colonies, and they voted to declare independence from England. But I want you to notice in both cases... It was lawfully ordained authority that rebelled against another authority. It may have been a greater authority, but it was still authority against authority. And it wasn't private citizens that were banding together and rebelling and declaring war against the government. Private citizens may not do this, but an established authority may, in the opinion of Samuel Rutherford, and the Puritans, and Parliament, and Cromwell, and the American uh, colonies uh, during those days. And by the way, that was not unanimous, <laughs> but the majority did, did win the day. There, there's a struggle in this, but this is something we, we have to make our own decision on. And then finally, our favorite subject, taxation. What about taxation? You know, it appears from the list that I just gave you uh, about what Samuel said it was going to cost Israel if you have a king. It appears that the king took about a tenth of his country's wealth. You know, a tithe went to the government, and if you read the Old Testament, a tithe also was used to, to support the, <clears throat> the church in those days, the sacrificial system, the priests, and all of that. But a tenth in, in those days. Now, when you add up I tried to do this, but it was too difficult. But when you add up all the taxes that we pay today to the city and to the state and to the federal government, not to mention property taxes, sales taxes, gasoline taxes, I mean, everything's taxed. I think if you were to add up everything that we're taxed on, that the amount would probably either approach or exceed 50%. You know, we, we pay a lot of taxes. Now, add to this the fact that our government is using most of this money that we pay in taxes outside of their God-given God mandate, you know, and, and what is their mandate? Well, their mandate is to protect our, our life and liberty. Outside of that, they're doing things, you know, that, that really don't fall into that rubric, so they're, they're misusing the, the, uh, the money we pay them. So the question is, do we continue to pay taxes or not? Well, let me just again remind you <clears throat> to whom Paul is recommending that we pay our taxes in Romans 13, to Nero, right? Was Nero using that money correctly? Rome using that money rightly? They're probably doing a better job with it than we are, you know. But they were still abusing it, okay? But Paul doesn't make an exception here. He doesn't say if they use it rightly, pay it. He just simply says pay it, okay? And let's not forget what Jesus said. Render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. Jesus even gave us an example of paying a tax, what's called the pull tax, for himself and for Peter, when both of them knew that neither of them owed this tax. Jesus said, let's give it so that we don't give them an offense. So in other words, pay the tax even if you don't owe the tax to, to give a good witness. Now, so the, 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 I think from these things we have to conclude, we, we pay those taxes. I mean, take advantage of all the deductions that you get when you, you do your taxes on a, ba on a yearly basis and, you know, try to get as much of that back as you can. You know, try to use every, everything the government allows, but do pay uh, what, what you owe. 
But at the same time, let's not forget that in our culture, we do have certain recourse besides using those um, you know, benefits that some people might be able to get. We have avenues which Paul didn't have and, and the believers in those days did not have. We, we can vote. Sadly, most people who vote on things that cost money, they vote them up, you know, and if somehow they keep forgetting that it's going to cost more and more and more. But we can vote. We can lobby. We can petition. We can get petitions signed. We can contact representatives. We can even run for office and try to influence legislation. That's certainly something that couldn't happen in Paul's day. But we should use it to curb this evil in our government and to bring things more into conformity to God's will. And let's not forget our most important tool, you know, the thing that God has given to us that we can use above everything else to make a change. And that is prayer. I should say two, two tools. We can pray and we can share the gospel until people's hearts change. Okay, government is going to continue to do what it's doing. But lastly, let's not forget that when we pay taxes, okay, we're not responsible for what the government does with our taxes. We're only responsible to pay them. They're going to have to give an account to God for that. We are not supporting what they're doing. We're simply obeying God because we are being faithful to what God calls us to do, which is to support the government to pay the taxes that are levied against us. So when we do it, we have God in mind. I'm serving Him. I'm supporting His institution. I'm not supporting what they're doing, okay? And we need to be thankful at the same time still that in, in the midst of all the chaos that's going on right now, it still could be worse, and God has given the government, and through the government, He's given this good that we have. We're not in total anarchy, and we need to be thankful for that. God means government for our good, because He does care about us. Well, let's, um, let's bow and let's ask the Lord to search our hearts as we think through all the things that we have seen uh, regarding government and um, see whether we have been looking at it properly and thanking God for what He has given us. But at the same time, let's pray that God would change the hearts of our leaders and bring them more into conformity with His will.